I didn't think it would ever get this good. <laughs> I'm Justin Tierney and I'm here with Willie Ruff and today we're going to be talking about his Harmony of the World project which is a realization of the music of the spheres which is this ancient idea that the proportions and movements of the planets create a kind of cosmic music and Willie has worked on this project using Kepler's equations about planetary motion to make them what he calls a realization for the ear. The first thing I wanted to ask you Willie was about the origins of this project. The origins of this project actually began with uh, not a scientist, but a musician, one of the greats of the 20th century, Charlie Parker. And uh, I was in the Army, about to get out of the Army Air Force in 1949, when I happened to read in a jazz magazine an interview with Charlie Parker, in which he was asked the following question. Bird, if you could do with your life for the next several years, uh, any, you know, anything you wanted to do, what would that be? And he said, that's easy. He said, there is a musician, a German, whose music I've heard on recordings and whose writings some I've heard, I've read, and he said, I'm totally fascinated by what this, this man knows and the way he writes music. And he said, if I had my druthers, I would go and find him at Yale University where he is teaching. That man was Paul Hindemith that um, Charlie Parker was referring to. I'd never heard the name, I'd never heard his music, and I knew nothing at all about music theory. Uh, but I said, it's time now to start my education. I've earned it on the GI Bill and uh, I'm going to go and uh, make an application to that place where this Paul Hindemith is and miraculously they sent me an application, invited me to come uh, for an audition and they let me in. A miracle of all miracles. And uh, when I had been around long enough to take Paul Hindemith's class on the history of the theory of music, I discovered that uh, Hindemith was more involved with the science of music and understanding uh, the, the origins of, of uh, musical science and acoustics and proportions and all these things. And I, I knew, or I said to myself, Charlie Parker might not have been happy with, with all, of, all of this because here was Paul Hindemith stuck back in the, in the 1600s and 1500s with the Johannes Kepler's uh, uh, data. So that was the origins of, of that. And I learned quickly that Hindemith was not uh, interested in constructing a cosmic music box using Kepler's uh, writings uh, and theories that way. But uh, it was his way of, of teaching and he was at the same time writing an opera on Kepler's life. Um, so that was the origins. In the, the medieval model of the seven liberal arts, there's the, the later four, the quadrivium, which were the subjects of measurement. This is arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. And it's said that when a student would study these, they would have to learn music before they can learn astronomy. You know, why would this be? I think because the, the, uh, the, the, the evidence is closer at hand than with astronomy. You didn't need telescopes or, you know, and, and the, the, we were really duped for a long time about what was really taking place out there in, in the heavens. And Kepler's great contribution was to clear that up. You know, once the, 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 the sun-centered uh, universe was, was then identified, then Kepler was, was you know, next in line to, to uh, discover the three laws of planetary motion which were really landmarks. 25 years after your class with Paul Hindemith, in 1972, you are now teaching at Yale. Mm -hmm. And you said that you finally had your chance to explore the connections between music and other sciences and art. And you put together a colloquium on rhythm. Yes. And how did that come about? Well, 
the colloquium on, on rhythm um, came about because I knew um, some pretty uh, high-powered scientists, not all, not just at Yale, but in, in other walks of, of life. And there was one, one scientist named Warren McCulloch, who was a, a great cyberneticist. And he, he, was a, he specialized in studies of the brain. And uh, he died. And I, I met him again through a jazz connection. His daughter came to Birdland, where Mitchell and I were playing one Halloween, uh, not Halloween, Valentine's Day. And it happened to be Warren McCulloch's daughter's birthday and Dwight Mitchell's birthday. And they invited us to come to their table for, to have a drink. And, they, and we said, you know, they learned that I lived in New Haven at the time. And they lived in Old Lyme, Connecticut, and they invited us up to their. They have a horse, a horse farm up there, and they said our daddy, our, my dad is, a, is a, a earth sci- a rather a neuroscientist, and said uh, you come up and and visit us there, and I I discovered this fairly fascinating person named in in Warren McCullough. And when he died uh, in 1970, none of the science that he was involved with, none of the institutions like MIT and, you know, he had taught here at Yale Medical School and had gone to school here as well. As well. But uh, none, none of his scientific colleagues had celebrated his life in any kind of meaningful way. and. Uh, I happened to drop his name at a at a fellows meeting in uh, Branford College, where another scientist who had been a protege of his, right? and I I it came out that that I had known McCullough, and uh, this guy worshipped at his at his feet very much the way Charlie Parker did Paul Hendeman, and the, this this man was uh, actually chief of uh, neurology at Yale Medical School. Right? And he said, we ought to, since we both were friends of his, maybe we can cook up something to, to do uh, that will honor him. And he said, you, you guys are poor over where you are. You don't have money there at the School of Music. At the medical school, we got money. <laughs> and we have access to money. And he says, if you come up with a great idea that will be worthy of Warren, a memorial to, to Warren McCulloch to celebrate, we'll find the funds to do it. And I kicked around a lot of, lot of stuff, and I talked to McCulloch's wife, his widow, and found out that, that he, uh, <clears throat> mathematics was really his, his, his world. And he, uh, he went to Haverford before he came this is a little long. <laughs> it's all right. He went to Haverford before he came to Yale, and there was the the president of Haverford College Quaker School, right, named Rufus Jones. And Rufus Jones saw that McCulloch was just brilliant beyond all of his peers. There, that, that this was really something special. And he said to him, called him into him, freshman year, right, called him into the office and said, Warren, what will the B? And, and he said, Warren shrugged, he said, I don't know. He said, well, what will we do with our life? And McCulloch says, well, I'm not sure. And uh, he says, uh, Rufus Jones says, what occupies thy mind most? And McCulloch says, I keep asking myself, what is number that man may know it? And what is man that he may know number? Mm-hmm. And Rufus Jones says, "Thee will be busy for the rest of thy life." <laughs> so McCulloch made all of these fabulous contributions to his science, and he said that was all he ever asked. Uh, that was the, uh, the the one big question that, that that preoccupied him. So. I thought about that for a little while, and I said, well, the embodiment of that might be a big colloquium on rhythm. It's something that, that we perceive 
by its numberness and through our special human way of, of uh, understanding number and experiencing experiencing number you know so we organized an international conference on the subject interdisciplinary conference on the subject of rhythm here at Yale and we had just every kind of presentation from dancers to talks on the experience of time uh, actually one of the great uh, metallurgists from MIT was a friend of McCulloch's who lived and worked there and died there uh, this metallurgist gave a, a presentation on, on molecular symmetry and dis dissymmetry. This man had been the, the lead um, metallurgist for the Manhattan Project. So that's, <laughs> that's high powered metallurgy when you, you know, have to do all of that stuff together. So out of this concern with, with, with rhythm, I found myself surrounded in, by a lot of other scientists on this on this campus, and one of them was a man named John Rogers, who was one of the great great uh, geologists. And stratigraphy is his uh, was his was his field. His work is now being revisited uh, in the exploration of Mars and, and all, of, all of that stuff. It's really figuring out uh, those 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 things. And I enlisted John Rogers' help in. I said, you know, what has happened now suddenly since Hindemith died in 1963 and since Kepler's death, you know, still in the 1600s, said um, several things have happened now that would make it possible for us today to pick up Kepler's challenge. That is to, so we can make a planetarium for the ear. Uh, that nobody could do before, and the things that had happened were computers and tone generators, so that you could marry these tone generators to the computers, on, and we, that we did with the help of a uh, graduate student who was a friend of Milton Babbitt's down at Princeton, and Mark Rosenberg wrote this program using entirely Kepler's data. It, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with Ruff and Rogers. This came to, from from Kepler's 1619 uh, book called The Harmony of the World. And um, it was realized in Bell Labs down in New Jersey uh, using punch cards. <laughs> We're talking about 36, 37 years ago. And punch cards. Uh, so that was how we arrived at what we, what we began.
Kepler mentioned this intriguing idea that there's a point of maximum consonance. Yes. When does this occur? Kepler promised this, and, and how, how he came to these conclusions as early as 1619 without having any, any you know, he couldn't even look through the telescope because his eyes were so bad, you know. And, uh, but everything, all of the relationships that he saw there, he could see on paper through, through and through his knowledge of, of music theory. He, he was trained with the quadrivium, you know, he, he was, so that he, he, he said at those moments in cosmic time, when the orbits uh, and, and, the, and the planets in their orbits are at the closest point to the sun or the farthest points from, from the sun will be the large number of consecutive consonant events where the chords, the relationships that we would hear as chords, major, minor, and all other flavors you know, of, it, of it there. And I, I'm curious as to how he could see that, you know, it, uh, I don't, don't know how much data he would have to have run in order to come to, to come to that conclusion, but we can test it now, you know, we can find those, those spots at which the sun is at aphelion or perihelion, you know, and then just run it, run it through the program and hear it. Kepler had some interesting ideas about uh, the tilt of the, or the axis of each planet and mm -hmm. particularly he's so well known for mentioning the tilt of the earth. Mm -hmm. Well I, I don't think he, it made a difference in his perception or, or idea of what the, 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 the earth sound would be. That's simple enough it just, it just goes, it, it moves about a half step you know uh, roughly that. But uh, he had another job, you know, as a as a court mathematician. These that, well, that means they make up horoscopes for the, you know, for the aristocracy. That's what they're paid to do, you know. <laughs> they they have their court astrologers, and unfortunately, he didn't have much. You know, he was a scientist, a pure scientist, and he didn't have much respect for astrologers. But he did the work because he had to feed his family, right? And he turned out to be good at it, you know? <laughs> Predictions that he made, so he was a victim of his own success. Hindemith has some of that in the opera. The opera is so realistic, you know. Uh, Kepler's mother was accused of being a witch, and they were gonna burn her like they burned the, the Salem uh, uh, witches, you know? And he used his influence with, you know, with royalty and Emperor Rudolph and people like, like that, maybe whose horoscopes he had, he had cast, to save his mama from, you know, from the woodpile. And uh, she, she wanted him to stop fooling around with this science at which you could starve to death. Nobody made money as a scientist, but she, she says, if you stop, you know, that nonsense that you're carrying on with, the, with, with all of this plotting and stuff, and turn lead into coal. <laughs> that will be the. That'll be you know. That'll that'll be the solution to to our problems. And there's a scene in the graveyard where she's digging up her husband's skull, and Kepler is supposed to take it and do something and to make you know to make some some kind of potion that will empower him to have supernatural powers to to do alchemy and. That, that kind of, it's, it's quite a bizarre story, you know. Yeah. Your colloquium on rhythm turned into the interdisciplinary seminar on rhythm, yes. which I was lucky enough to enroll in. Well, uh, and what kind of things did we study in that class? We looked at um, rhythm in, in, in geology, and that we would always, I would always let, ask these people, we would go to different uh, departments on the campus, and uh, they would allow us to to come as a as a group. And a specialist would always do a presentation to talk about you know the rhythm and in, in the in the formation of of rocks and how 
how uh, how geologists uh, relate to rhythm in there into their work, particularly stratigraphers. And it happened at a very important time because it was just at the moment that the whole science of tectonic plates were being established. And John Rogers played a major part in, in that, my collaborator for the, for the astronomy. And then there was uh, Dr. Glaser, the, the, neuro, the neurologist in the medical school, you know, who talked about the role of brain in fine rhythmic control. You know, when you do little motions like that, it's very different from the big, from the big ones. And, and they were studying stroke patients and epilepsy and all of this. So we could, you know, we went to the, to the medical school and saw them working in, you know, in, in, with, with brain stuff. Also, uh, rhythm and architecture. Kent Bloomer, the, the ornamental architect uh, here who teaches there, uh, just take, would take us on walks around the, around the campus and show us things that have to do with, with rhythm in space that, that architects are involved with. And uh, in, in Louis Kahn's, uh, the two museums that, 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 are, that are there. Um, what a, oh, one great one was, who was also a colleague of, of uh, McCulloch's. This man specialized in the study of lakes, limnology. Uh, that he was probably the world's greatest, lim, best known limnologist, but he did uh, a, a program, a lecture each year on what's called the alternate wet and dry periods of lake beds. When when it's dry, the the life in the lake go way down deep, you know, and you think they're dead or gone, but then when it's wet again, it comes back in greater perfusion, you know, and, and with, with greater rhythmical resonances that, that, you know, that are interesting to study. So we, you know, poets, dancers, every aspect of, of uh, rhythm that, that we as humans uh, are able to, to realize, I, we're interested in looking at. And this campus is rich with people with interdisciplinary interests and so. So I hear that you're approaching this project anew now, and how will the new project be different than the previous one? This project now, uh, I have wanted to revisit this for a long time, but found neither the time nor the technology. Uh, but all of a sudden, the, the technology is just, it's mind-boggling what has, has developed this super collider that that we've got there in that program called Audacity that Scott Peterson. And one of the things that I wanted to do with this project is, uh, and John Rogers wasn't interested in, in this, we, we uh, actually uh, made this realization for the ear of the Keplerian model of, of the solar system. I suggested to, to Rogers that we, we, just as a matter of, of, of uh, illustrating how far off the Earth-centered one was, is that we construct a, a model using the Earth as center. And that, because that was the way everybody was thinking about uh, astronomy before Copernicus and, and Kepler's uh, time. And uh, so we might, we might be able to, to, to do that. So that you'll see these planets in retrograde and things that are just not happening in, in, real, in real life. But it would be an instruction. Uh, uh, it would be helpful as an instructional tool. The other thing is that we had to compress time so severely that the outer three planets that we hear as only beats in this in this realization uh, are actually going too fast for us to perceive the subtleties uh, in their relationships. But when you slow those things down, like 100, 200, 300 percent, then it really it gets interesting and you know you, you, you see the, the, the syncopations that you, if they go by too quickly, you can't, you, you know, they, we miss it. You know. But we, we, for that first realization, we compressed time so that one Earth year was 10 seconds. You know. So if we really slow that down, we can hear all of those Rhythmical, and it was quite frankly, I was more interested in these rhythmical relationships of the outer three planets that Kepler never knew. 
Uh, uh, I was interested, of course, in the in the uh, inner six and the harmony that that we talk about dissonance and, and and harmony in terms of vibrating frequencies. But those outer three rhythms were I was more curious about uh, about that, and I want to play with that. My name is Scott Peterson. Uh, I work uh, in the Department of Music at Yale University. Willie first contacted me because he had the original um, Kepler files on a CD and he wanted to be able to, to hear them in quad. And then uh, he wanted to see what it would be like uh, if we could apply some transformations to the files. So uh, we slowed them down a little bit and, and he liked the sound of them uh, slower. And we slowed them down a little bit more and a little bit more and eventually I think we had a factor of 150 percent slower than the original and um, the transformation process was um, both in terms of, of pitch and uh, speed so um, there was a considerable lowering of all of the frequencies um, and it really lets you hear the beating of the different parts the outer planets as it were and it gives you a much better rhythmic profile of, of what's actually happening in the relationship of those planets sonically and it was really cool and he really dug that process a lot. I'm, a, I'm anxious now to um, look at it as a even larger more useful teaching tool because now the, the, with the computer sophistication we don't need big planetarium projectors to see or to experience it. For instance, they didn't have the projectors in our, our uh, uh, planetarium here, like what we're used to seeing in the Hayden in, in New York. Uh, they were just doing it on, well, I guess it was a little bit more than laptops, but, but they were, you know, very compact computer there. But I want to be able to, um, for the first time, uh, have this experience in surround sound. We didn't have that before. We just the sound just goes from speaker to speaker in stereo. But surround sound is is really the way to to experience that. As a matter of fact, they didn't even have it in the planetarium, as you as you will, will recall. And to be able to uh, manipulate these these speeds of the of the so that of the of the planets and of the uh, you know orbital um, data of every kind. I want to see just how much humans can experience from, from that data and the technology that we have now. Mm. Children love it. You know, it. It's great to take, to go into a classroom with, with this, you know, with that, that sound and, and uh, even just with the sound, but to be able to do it then in a way that, that they can experience it you know, uh, in surround sound and, and also be able to p project the, the images so that we can more closely uh, understand the, the, the relationships of that movement. This all becomes, I think, much more interesting for somebody who's interacting with the data from a, a learning point of view. Um, they don't want to see equations and data necessarily. What they want is an aural picture of how the solar system works, which is really cool. And we can do that, and we can do it in a lot of different ways. It's a great thing to be here where I am at this juncture in my, in my career and my life, uh, because it, all of a sudden um, I'm working on, on two other, other projects that really are looking at kind of origins and trying to understand, you know, Austin and, and I just worked on, finished working on a, a project having to do with congregational singing and uh, as a part of, of American folk culture, you know, and I'm doing the same thing now with recorded jazz because um, when Thomas Edison invented the, the uh, talking machine, he intended it to be just that a talking machine, and he was soundly disappointed when he learned that, that humans were more interested in listening to music than, than to listening to talk. He, in the abstract for the application for the talking machine, he said this device will be 
a boon uh, to business communication and to it made the dictograph the you know dictaphone and all of all of that so that stenography was a big was a big industry at that time totally male dominated you know edison himself had male secretaries and all of the all of these things. and he when when he finally did you know when it was clear that music was going to be the the real beneficiary of of this invention he was unhappy he he didn't like popular music and he didn't like jazz in particular <laughs> so now at about the point where it's almost a, a century since jazz has been on on phonograph records uh, i put together this this course last year called um, thomas edison's talking machine and the american jazz century because it's been almost a hundred years now that the, the classic jazz just started to appear on records and i'm i've found a lot of the people who were involved with you know making making those those masterpieces and what i've done is gone to them what i did in 74 even before the kepler project and interviewed several of, of these these artists and uh, putting it together now it's it's fascinating to see how the individuals overlap how the styles are one in, in influenced by by the others and just how the serendipity of of these people being in contact with 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 one another social circumstances surrounding that how clearly and intricately uh intimately they were the, the underworld you know the gangsters uh, got involved in 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 all of that and did some without intending to did some very very positive things you know they and that certainly was not on their on their agenda but uh it, it's it, i'm having the time of my life uh doing it. i didn't think it would ever get this good <laughs> <laughs>